Well, thank you all for joining us for this panel, Cultivated Meat, When Will It Hit the Shelves? Uh, this event is hosted by the Brooks McCormick Jr. Animal Law and Policy Program at Harvard Law School and part of a timely virtual flagship panel series in advance of the release of the award-winning documentary, Meet the Future. To learn more about the series and the film, please visit meetthefuture.com. Our panelists today are Dipti Kulkarni, Eric Schultze, and Kelly McGill. I will read you each of their bios and then we'll dive right into to starting the conversation. Dipti Kulkarni is a partner at Sidley Austin LLP, where she advises clients on a wide range of FDA and USDA regulatory matters, including issues related to federal oversight of food and animal products developed using novel and emerging technologies. Her cutting edge practice includes counseling clients using cellular agriculture, synthetic biology, gene editing, and other innovative technologies to develop and commercialize products. As a leading regulatory expert, she is a sought after speaker on these and other complex regulatory matters and has played a major role in the development and implementation of the regulatory frameworks for alternative proteins and bioengineered products. Dipti also serves as an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown Law School, where she teaches food and drug law. Before joining Sedley, Dipti served as associate chief counsel at FDA, where she received several awards, including the FDA Award of Merit, FDA's highest award. Very lucky to have her. Eric Schultz, a PhD, is a professional molecular biologist, genetic engineer, and former federal biotechnology regulator. He currently is vice president of product and regulation at Upside Foods, where he leads both design and development of the company's meat products, as well as its regulatory policy and government affairs. Dr. Schultz also serves in a company spokesperson capacity. He previously served as senior scientist for Upside Foods, where he led the cell line development efforts. Before that, he served as a U.S. Food and Drug Administration regulator, handling a portfolio of novel food and drug biotechnology products. As a civil servant, Dr. Schultz also served as a federal STEM education policy, uh, served as a STEM education policy capacity within the National Science Foundation, and currently works with the National Academy of Sciences on undergraduate STEM education transformation. He holds a doctorate in genetic, cellular, and molecular biology with a specialty in embryonic stem cell engineering and is trained in broadcast communication, speech writing, and risk assessment. Kelly McGill represents the Good Food Institute on Capitol Hill and in front of executive branch agencies as a federal lobbyist. Prior to GFI, Kelly researched and drafted legislation related to agriculture, the environment, and telecommunications for the Vermont General Assembly's nonpartisan Office of Legislative Council. Kelly also has served as a legal fellow for the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, and as a student advocate in the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Clinic. Kelly holds a BA magna cum laude in international studies and a BS magna cum laude in business administration from Trinity University and is JD cum laude from Harvard Law School and is one of our proud graduates. Uh, very grateful to have you all here. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Um, so back in 2016, when I attended the first US Cellular Agriculture Conference in San Francisco, I was surprised that no one was really talking about regulation. Whenever I would bring it up with some of the other attendees, I was met either it seemed kind of fell in two categories, either blank stares or dirty looks. Uh, the blank stare crowd, when pressed, were saying, well, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm sure there's a bunch of smart people like Dipti who will just figure this all out down the road. Um, the dirty look folks were like, you know, telling me to shut the hell up because there are investors around and they didn't want to let on that there were any potential hurdles down the road. Um, but, you know, in looking into it, I, I felt that, that this issue was really serious and there were some potentially existential regulatory issues that should be sort of mapped out. Um, and so this led to our animal and policy program here at Harvard Law School, organizing a, a clean meat regulatory roundtable back in 2018. Uh, and the goal of that was to bring a bunch of interested parties together to objectively assess the regulatory landscape for cultivated meat and poultry products, um, and hopefully chart a pathway forward that uh, we might be able to recommend. So we had several former FDA attorneys, we had the heads of several companies, we had scientists such as Mark Post, um, advocacy folks from the Good Food Institute, and uh, even a former US Secretary of Agriculture, Ann Veneman. So, uh, and uh, you know, that really helped the conversation we had over those couple of days really informed the comments that we ended up submitting to the, to the agencies. So Dipti, you participated in that round table. So I'll start with you. If you were creating a food regulatory system from scratch today, I'm not sure any of us would separate and bifurcate authority across the USDA and FDA the way it's set up today. Can you describe the two agencies' traditional roles in regulating food? Sure, and, and before I launch in, I just wanna take a moment here to, to emphasize the, the role that 
um, Harvard Law School has played in, in all of this and the animal law and policy program in particular, the, the round table, I think was truly incredible bringing um, multidisciplinary folks together to start talking about the regulatory issues that you that you described, Chris. And I think having it in that in that forum and in that way um, brought together some really great great ideas. Um, and, and so, with respect to the the question about the bifurcated system, you know, um, I get asked this question a lot. I'm sure Eric gets asked this question, and I know Kelly um, has has thought about this as well. And and uh, often it's also raised within the context of a potential movement to a, to a one agency approach to our food system. Uh, so it's a, a bit of an evergreen issue that comes up, I don't know, almost every political cycle. Um, and of course, there is an urge to respond to that question by saying that the current system is overlapping and confusing and who really understands this. And while that um, observation may in back to bear, bear some truth, what, what comes next is the harder question, which is why the system is set up this way and, and, and why should it keep moving forward this way? And our food system is based on over a century of precedent and laws that, that took shape at the turn of the 20th century and were formally established in 1938 and subsequently amended many times over. So we're not talking about something that was written in anybody's lifetime, solely written in anybody's lifetime on the screen. Um, and, and the lines that have been drawn, including those um, pertaining to cultivated meat, reflect that history um, and are set in our food laws and implementing regulations. Again, many of which have taken years, if not decades, to establish and implement. They also have shaped the expertise and experience and programs of the agencies, and we'll focus on FDA and USDA's FSIS today. Uh, so rewriting that history and body of law, practice and experience and expertise, and completely reorganizing the agencies is no, is no small feat, which is why it hasn't happened, right? <laughs> there's been, there's been um, questions raised and proposals put forward and to date, We've not seen any really move in a dramatic way and towards the, the, the direction of a major consolidation or reorganize, reorganization. And so what has happened instead is that um, in the case of really nearly any, any uh, or nearly all new um, and emerging technologies, the agencies analyze and interpret their current laws and adapt them to new technologies. And that's exactly what we're seeing here with the formal agreement between FDA and USDA's FSIS. It outlines a framework to ensure that cultivated products are safely and appropriately labeled prior to and during commercialization. And that framework, while it might feel, feel new um, because the technology is, is, is new, the time is passing quickly, um, uh, that framework is based on longstanding law and policy. So, so in a nutshell, for, for all cultivated, um, meat and poultry products, FDA will regulate tissue collection, cell lines, and banks, all components and inputs, and then cell prolifer proliferation and differentiation through the, the time of harvest. Um, and for seafood, with the exception of catfish, which we can save for another day, <laughs> FDA also will regulate post-harvest operations um, and labeling. So FDA has the whole production cycle for seafood, for meat and poultry products up until harvest. Um, for meat and poultry products, FSIS picks up post-harvest and will regulate labeling um, and inspection. And FSIS uh, will, will also regulate what ultimately goes, goes into to commerce. And so FDA's oversight, beginning with the pre-harvest and full cycle for seafood is drawn from our current authorities. Currently, FDA evaluates the safety of new food ingredients in plant-based food and seafood, but also in meat and poultry products. So if somebody was making a new ingredient to put into a conventional sausage or some other conventional product, um, the starting point could very well be FDA if we're talking about a, a completely new ingredient. And with respect to seafood, FDA also regulates manufacturing and processing as well as labeling. 
um, FSIS oversight is likewise drawn from its current authorities. So currently FSIS regulates the labeling of meat and poultry products, um, including pre-market review of labeling and, and conducting inspections of, of processing operations, among other operations. And that's exactly what FSIS is doing for cultivated products. So the formal agreement um, provides for extensive oversight uh, in, this, in this category, beginning with tissue collection and cell banking all the way through to labeling and distribution to assure safety and, and appropriate labeling at nearly every step in the, in the production process. And it's largely based on existing law and practice um, and longstanding precedent. And this is how it plays into the strengths and experience of both agencies without having to rewrite history <laughs> or current law. Um, and, and, and that's why, you know, it, that's why it's set up the way that it is. Um, and that's, that's also why it can assure um, safety and labeling um, for these products. Great. And FCIS, you know, within the part of the, of the USDA broader. Um, wonderful. So Eric, kind of rewinding a bit before we dive into uh, more on the regulatory front, can you talk a little bit about what Upside Food does and maybe give a, a brief Cultivated Meat 101 for the listeners? Yes. And thanks for having the only non-attorney on this call. I feel incredibly intimidated. So thank you all for, uh, for making a, a lowly professional scientist feel welcome. Um, as, a, as a way in, so cultivated meat, uh, which has gone through several incarnations of names uh, and, and could be in the future as well, uh, that's probably something we'll discuss later, um, is a, and, and I represent Upside Foods. Uh, we're the first company in this space uh, formed in 2015, then known as Memphis Meats, uh, to develop cultivated meat, meaning real animal meat grown directly from animal cells, bypassing the need to grow the body or corpus of an animal. Not a new idea. The new part of this is the intentional commercialization of this process. It's again, an academic venture that's been around for over a hundred years at this point, but recently seriously looked into academically in the last 20 as genetic uh, 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 abilities to study the, gen the genome of animals, has increased um, and our tools to, to be able to scale up the technologies has, has become available. In short, what you do is take a small sample of cells from an animal, maybe a rice grain size from the muscle of, a, of an animal, an animal that's intended for the food supply. Um, that muscle contains muscle cells, muscle stem cells, fat cells, connective tissue, possibly skin. Um, and those cells are alive and running a genetic programming. As long as you continue to feed them, and give them a place to grow, they will continue to make more of themselves. And that's what we do. We bring that into our facility. It's clean. It looks like a cross between a small beer brewery and a small dairy operation. Lots of stainless steel, clean, clean tanks everywhere. Small plug if you are in the Bay Area to come tour our facility, if you're around. We entered in the facility. Those cells then are fed the same things the animal would eat. In this case, amino acids, vitamins, minerals, sugars, water, oxygen, and they're given heat and they're grown in a clean, sterile environment where they'll continue to grow and grow and grow uh, and produce muscle or skin or, or connective tissue or whatever, what have you. And in a shortened period of time, we harvest that, uh, that tissue or those cells, and then we process it just like any other meat tissue you might consume. The big difference is outside of not using the animal is the time. In this case, being able to grow these products takes significantly less time and uses less resources. So in this case, growing an, a cow from birth until slaughter or on the shelf at a grocery store is between 18 months and three years, depending on the breed and what you're doing. For us, you're doing a cow's worth of meat every two weeks or so. And so the lar and then paralleling that uh, in our th production platform, which can grow both cows, uh, cow meat, for example, or beef, pork, chicken, which we'll be going to market with first, can all be done under the same roof. And that's sort of the short version of, of, of how you produce cultivated meat. Um, wonderful. So can you describe your early interactions with the agencies? And I know that formerly Memphis Meats generated a lot of attention and surprise uh, from some by putting forth in 2018 this joint letter with the uh, North American Meat Institute. Um, can you talk a little bit about the interaction and, and the genesis of that letter? Yeah, and I'll tie this back to what Dipti said, because what she said was really important. 
the overarching and existing regulatory framework was more than adequate and is more than adequate today still to produce the regulatory frameworks necessary for novel foods and, and, and products and processes that are generated. It's often lobby or, or notion that the complexity of the US regulatory system is seen as a sort of a hindrance to innovation. I think the exact opposite is true, that the complexity allows us many tools in the toolbox. And as Dipti noted correctly, we were able to pull from those existing tools and put them together in existing law and precedent in order to make something that made sense for the regulation of cultivated meat without having to dip into new legislation or, or, or adding new authorities or what have you. And so I think Dipti, that's, that's a core, core press, uh, precedent for how we approach this. In, re in dealing with the agencies, that's really our approach was working with them, working together on knowing their, their authorities and, and as, again, Tibby and myself being ex-regulators ourselves, understand the need that there's a human at the other end of this and we needed to build a big tent, a coalition. Um, and then that everyone, it's in everyone's best interest to make a safe food product get to market effectively. And so that was the, the genesis of how we ended up working with the North American Meat Institute. There's, there's quite a bit more, but the general notion is building a big tent, which is a core value at Upside Foods. Yeah, that's great to hear. And again, was sort of surprising to some, but it's, it's interesting to see how the agencies ultimately decided to allocate jurisdiction in a way quite similar to what you and, and, and HLS recommended. Um, was there anything that surprised you uh, or is there anything particularly noteworthy? Dipti gave us a, a little overview of how the jurisdiction was allocated between the two USDA and, and FDA, but was there anything you particularly like to emphasize or anything that surprised you? I'll, I'll say that the, my surprise is that people don't realize how collaborative the two agencies are in real life. Uh, it is a normal, it is normal operation. And again, as, as Dipti noted, often the intake step for new ingredients, and again, forgive me for my non-lawyerly approach to this, um, is that FDA is sort of the first stop on, on, the, on the road to safety for any new food. Um, and, and then it's parsed out as needed uh, to uh, different agencies, different parts. And so I'm surprised that that, um, that was sort of lesser known. I think also, I think people were surprised a little bit that it didn't end up at a single agency early on. Um, but again, I think from a first principle approach, just a thoughtful read of the law. And again, this is why if you are running a company right now and you're listening to this, please get regulatory counsel early and often, talk to your regulators early and often. I'm sure Kelly has a lot of surprise in here too. All these lawyers will probably tell you the same. It's the, that as well as I will say, the second thing that surprised me in a very positive way is how, how truly welcoming the regulators were for this technology in terms of evaluating it being creative with the companies and going, we, we don't want to be the, we don't want to be the bottleneck for this technology getting to market. We want the market to settle whether this is actually something people want to buy or not. I don't know, but maybe Kelly has a, has a different thought on this than I do. That, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, you know, and 2018 really will be seen as a historical turning point, I believe, as things were moving so rapidly back then during those few months. Um, and it, but it is quite encouraging, as you say, that the FDA and USDA basically kind of follow the lead of what was suggested to them, both by by you all and and some of what we put together. Once it was determined that USDA FSIS was handling labeling as we all had envisioned and hoped, uh, our AOPP clinic student Kelly McGill took the initiative to send a, a polite warning petition, reminding them of, their, of the agency of their constitutional obligations and urging them not to implement rules that were overly restrictive or anti-competitive. Kelly, can you talk a little bit about what motivated your work on that petition? Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. And thank you for the invitation to, to be back at, at a clinic event and um, for helping to create the learning opportunities that the Animal Law and Policy Program and Animal Law and Policy Clinic at HLS provide. I feel incredibly fortunate to have been able to engage in these issues since my first year of law school in substantive ways, all the way from research to um, participating at agency hearings in the early stages of this process. And then as Chris mentioned, um, in the, in the development um, together with former clinical instructor, uh, Nicole Negawetti of the letter petition that then once USDA had received it, they interpreted it as a petition for rulemaking. Um, but to step back a moment, um, my initial inspiration for getting involved in this space touches upon what Dipti and Eric have already shared about 
these products, these meat poultry seafood products are essentially a way to produce more with less. And as we look at all of the myriad global challenges that our world is facing, everything from feeding a growing global population's demand for high quality, safe protein sources to the need to produce, produce food with less strain on our environment, um, produce proteins that require less water, that require less land, that emit fewer greenhouse gases, um, as well as to, to you know, create new proteins that, that are healthy and safe for consumers, um, that provide good paying jobs for food system workers and opportunities for farmers in, in America and across the world, as well as that, um, you know, speaking of my personal capacity, that, that help help improve conditions for, for animals, which was my, one of my initial inspirations. Can you summarize some of the, sorry, can you summarize some of the key points of, of that petition and what you were really trying to get across to the agency? Absolutely. So we were really hoping for what ultimately USDA and FDA have signaled their intent to do as they've moved forward in the labeling regulatory process. Um, we were advocating in the letter petition for a common sense level playing field approach that respects First Amendment commercial speech protections for these innovative food products. So we essentially provided an analysis of First Amendment jurisprudence um, as it relates to this issue area and made the argument that um, it's essentially too soon at, at, at this point still. And when, um, when we wrote the letter petition back in 2020, even though things have, have moved and progressed and there have been some exciting developments in this field, um, it's still early because there aren't products on the market yet. So to, to impose a, a blanket regulatory framework without having ever seen these products or having um, had the chance to actually look at proposed labels or the process by which these products are being made, it was just too early. So essentially, to bring it down to basics, we were advocating for um, a regulatory process that creates a level playing field for these products that, as, as Dipti said, doesn't de deviate from USDA precedent of regulating different foods using different food technologies, including meat and poultry products that are processed in different ways. And that respects commercial speech protections that doesn't outright ban the use of certain terms that really for, for preventing consumer confusion as much as anything else allows these products to be called what they truly are, which are meat and poultry products as it relates to USDA's jurisdiction. Um, so essentially, we were just advocating for really um, a common sense regulatory framework. And I've been personally very excited to see um, the initial indications around this space that um, USDA has signaled um, together with FDA with the advance notice of proposed rulemaking that they issued back in September. And, and that advanced notice of proposed rulemaking directly referenced uh, the clinic's petition, um, and they sent us a letter saying that it was sort of their formal response. So it, again, it's just amazing to see how a motivated student can have an idea and have the support, and then have you know be able to have kind of a direct impact on on, on how this this is unfolding. Dipti, and if I if I could add also just yeah, that also it's just good governance, and it's just the, it's nice to see the system work as it was designed to work, uh, and. And this is how it should work. We we have substantive input as a regulated industry or as a as an interested stakeholder, and and you're jumping in to see that 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 happen as well. Um, and so I think this is how the system works: academia, uh, public and private, all working together to sort of move towards one common outcome. It really is a great microcosm to to see all that unfold, and it's really heartening to see it happening so positively for sure. Um, Dipti, meat production today looks very different, as Eric just explained, than it did even a few, even traditional meat production looks very different than it did just a few generations ago. From breeding to the slaughterhouse, meat production in this country would be unrecognizable to our great grandparents. And full disclosure, I still manage an Illinois farm that's remained in my family for six generations. So I've, I've, I've seen all those sides. So when must meat labels disclose the actual production processes themselves? That's a great question. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the uh, petition letter that Kelly worked on um, talks about this issue, uh, uh, among other things. So in general, um, uh, both uh, USDA's FSIS and FDA 
uh, cons when they're when they're evaluating a new production or processing method and considering whether use of that production or processing method requires new labeling, um, what they consider is whether whether that method results in a material change in the finished product in comparison to a to a conventional product. And again, this isn't something that was just invented for cultivated meat. This is the way that the agencies have analyze this issue for new technologies for decades. Um, so factors that both agencies have considered are whether you've got a compositional, nutritional, functional, or organoleptic um, kind of characteristic change, um, identifying that change, understanding, understanding what it is, whether it's substantial, do you have a difference in terms of how consumers Use, um, use the product. And then if there is a difference, uh, evaluating whether, um, whether that difference warrants labeling. And, and by labeling, what agencies have required are disclosures in the form of a modified product or ingredient name. We've seen that from time to time. Or other statements that are intended to convey the difference to consumers. So we haven't seen that it's just the production method alone but really conveying the information to consumers that gives them the information that they would need to make informed purchase decisions about, about that change. Now, where there's an express statutory provision that might compel disclosure otherwise, that's an exception to this, to this rule. The agencies also must consider pre-existing standards or product terms and whether that should apply, those should apply to the product. And this is something that, um, that the, the petition letter that Kelly worked on um, spent some time analyzing. So it's not the case that those pre-existing terms just are, are prohibited from being able to be used for the new technology. You know, the question is, uh, why wouldn't they be able to be used? Is the use of those terms somehow false or misleading to consumers? And if, if, if there's an argument that there is misleading, are you meeting the, it, it, that the, the use of the terminology would be misleading? Are you meeting the First Amendment implications with respect to restricting speech, to prohibiting speech that's protected under the First Amendment? And these issues are something that are, are analyzed in, in the petition letter that Kelly worked on um, and, and also in other comments that have been submitted to various dockets, including by, by the Good Food Institute and, and HLS. Um, so this tells us a lot about what um, FSIS and FDA should consider. And we're seeing them consider those factors. When you go to the um, request for information that FDA published in 2020. You saw a set of questions where FDA asked, asked the vast majority of their questions were about, are there, are the, there are these sorts of changes? What are they? How should they be conveyed to the extent they exist? What about pre-existing terms or standards of identity? Can those continue to be used? And you see the same sort of questions in FSIS as ANPR, um, it has more questions, 14 questions, with questions within those questions, um, but most of them were designed to, to get, at, get at these specific issues. Great. And um, so speaking of the, the response there, have you had a chance to look at the, the volume and the substance of some of the comments submitted and what the timeline, what you think the timeline might be for a final rule to be published? So we, we are seeing it. A, a high volume for both of these comments. And, you know, one of the original petition that was filed um, that was also discussed in the, in the ANPR had over 6,000 comments, which I think makes it one of the most um, commented on petitions in FSIS history. Um, with respect to the ANPR on the FSIS side, that, that ANPR has received, and that's an advanced notice to proposed rulemaking, um, lots of acronyms are going to be used <laughs> in this conversation. Um, nearly uh, 1,200 comments were filed. Um, on the FDA side, we saw around 40 comments uh, that were in response to the request for information on the labeling of foods comprised of or containing cultured seafood cells, is what FDA called it. And we saw, we saw, you know, comments from consumers, um, many in support of the technology, some on the other side. Um, and we also saw substantive, substantive and detailed comments submitted to both agencies. On the FSIS side, which is the more recent of the two comment periods, 
the ANPR closed in November of last year. Um, there were points of difference, particularly with respect to specific terminology, but there also seems to be a number of points of consensus, even more so than what we saw um, in the RFI responses, which I think is very encouraging. Many comments maintain that it's imperative for labeling to make clear that products were derived from or contain animal cells or tissue, um, sort of underscoring what, what Kelly said um, moments ago. Many comments maintain that the specific species, whether it's chicken, pork, or beef, must be identified in, in labeling to give consumers accurate information, which is a departure from the original petition that was filed, um, which asserted that those terms should not be used, particularly beef, for this technology, um, products derived from this technology. Many uh, comments urged FSIS to require labeling to make clear when a product is mixed with conventional product or with plant-based products. Um, that was a real, real consensus point. Um, a good number of comments took the uh, position that existing terms like burger, filet, patty, the terms that consumers are have grown quite familiar with because they convey functionally how to use the food to some degree. Many comments agreed that those should be used, um, permitted to be used for this technology as long as any corresponding requirements are met. Um, something that Eric alluded to moments ago is the, the, the potential shifts in terminology um, within, the, within the cultivated industry, there seems to be growing consensus around use of that term, perhaps accompanied with other terminology making clear. Um, where, where the product was derived from. And we're seeing that as a, a development in, in that direction. And any sense, uh, given your experience with the agency on, on what a, a potential timeline for a, a rule to be published might be? So, you know, labeling rules take time. <laughs> they, they um, the, the way that we label foods um, is, is a really um, complex and important issue um, in this country. And so I, I think we're, it's going to take some time. Again, remember this is an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. The next step under, uh, under general procedures would be for FSIS to publish a notice of proposed rulemaking presumably informed by the many comments received for the ANPR, which, which, um, which was requested by many in the industry, um, and then a final rule. Um, so I think we've got, we've got um, a runway in front of us. Um, having said that, FSIS has made very clear that they will make individual product label determinations on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not the case that that um, they would preclude commercialization until their rulemaking period ended. That if they did, that of course would raise First Amendment issues, which Kelly would remind them of. <laughs> um, and so despite this runway ahead of us, I'm, I think it's, uh, we've got some product determinations that can be made with respect to labeling in the future. That's great. And, and Eric, to your point about sort of governance actually working, you know, given that there's 330 plus million humans in this country, all of whom eat food, on some level, it's sort of astounding that 6,000 comments on such a major issue is, is a record. Um, so um, I know that Upside Food submitted public comments to the USDA on the, on the labeling AMPR. What's your company's position on requiring cultivated products to bear labels, differentiating them from slaughtered meat and poultry products? Yeah, in a, in a phrase, our, we believe our labels should be truthful, not misleading. I mean, in, in compliance with the law, uh, and and I mean, it, that's as simple as that. But but taken a little bit further, I know there's there's some nuance here. Um, we've also sort of been at the the forefront of advocating for mandatory disclosures of the production method as well. We think that it's really important to Dipti's point as well that consumers understand what they're buying, and we happen to be also feeling an upside as well that there's inherent value in knowing that these are cultivated products. Like we think people will seek them out because they are disclosed. Um, so we've we've taken that position as well, and and obviously we advocate for the position or the the term cultivated, uh, as well as, as as something in cultivated chicken, cultivated beef, something like that as well. Um, and and again, we'll be going to market with a cultivated chicken product. Um, so our position, of course, is that these products are uh, are real meat products. For example, meat poultry, 
or seafood if we're, we're producing those. So the, our position is that we'll be also sitting alongside, you know, when we are at retail, sitting alongside conventional products in the in you know at the grocery store, for example. But from a from a practical standpoint, we will we are highly in favor of, of course, a mandatory disclosure of the nature of production, um, as well as you know, again, fitting into existing standards of identity and, and people understanding that if we are producing a a hamburger that people understand that that is a that is a familiar product and they're what they're getting nutritionally, compositionally, and functionally organoleptically. It's going to be very similar, uh, and and will consumers will not have to relearn potentially how this how to handle these products. Now that's it. Um, down the road, as a company, we've we've also talked about the idea of of what meat can be, um, and this idea that and Uma Valetti, our our co-founder and CEO. He's a medical doctor. He's a cardiologist, and he's always wanted to produce meats that that have some fashion of a of an altered nutritional profile that makes them potentially an added protein or lower saturated fat red meat. Those sorts of things. Now, there's a and and, and Dipti and Kelly and Chris, you can probably you know better than I do. The 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 bar for being able to establish such things is quite high. Uh, but you know that's where we think a lot of a lot of companies in the space will be going, uh, and certainly Upside will will eventually look down the road towards that. But for now, the meat will be what you expect it to be. And Dipti talked about there were fourteen questions in AMPR with multiple sub questions. Did, did anything in there, again, surprise you uh, that they were asking um, or particularly encourage you? So, so the questions were very detailed, a bit more detailed than, than FDA's request for information. That, that didn't go unnoticed. Um, the, the AMPR itself, holding in my hand, um, um, also had <laughs> so a, uh, have to have the paper, um, uh, uh, also had a, a robust background section, which Provided a lot of the history that um, that you know we we talked about and and set you know some clear rules about when um, FSIS can can compel labeling um, and so so the most of the questions are designed to address the issues that we've talked about what are the products what are what are potential material differences what are the nature and the source of the products those are all regulatory considerations when you're thinking about the, the appropriate name of a product. And then it shifts into those, trying to get more information about material differences. Um, so those did not, uh, I think, those should not be a surprise. Um, there were some questions relating to um, the request for economic data and consumer research. Um, that, that were interesting. Um, you know, you can see FSIS is trying to understand um, issues relating to the economics of production, what this will mean in the in the supply chain, in the distribution chain, and how consumers are thinking about this, um, which isn't necessarily surprising, but is certainly a little bit outside of the usual kind of analyses um, for, for compelling speech or establishing a labeling requirement under the statutory uh, provisions um, that are relevant here. So not yeah. completely surprising, interesting to see about the consumer data and, and economic research. And Eric, you mentioned standards of identity. Can you give a quick uh, layperson's explanation of, of what those are? I love that you you asked the non-lawyer. Uh, there's three people here that could just knock this out of the park. Uh, and you asked the, the one person who didn't study law to, to understand that. Uh, okay, uh, Dipti will correct me, I'm sure. I want uh, a layperson's explanation. So if I uh, ask the lawyer, it'll be a 10 okay. <laughs> Sure, sure. The, no, the, the simplest way I can look at it is again, if I'm, if I'm a consumer and I, I buy something that I've been buying my entire life and it has a name that, that I understand, um, and a variation on its nutritional content and its form and its factor and how it handles in a pan or I roast it, will it always perform that way roughly? Am I roughly expecting a sausage to always look like a sausage? Am I expecting a hamburger to always look and taste and perform like a hamburger? Um, does it, a hamburger should generally speaking contain meat? Like I think that would be, it's sort of common sense ways of looking at how do we identify common foodstuffs. Peanut butter will have a standard of identity. Famously, there's a standard held at, the, at NIST in, in, in Maryland. But it's basically like, what is the common sense way of looking at what is What should this food look like or behave or taste like? 
I'm sure there's a much better legal answer than a Dipti or Kelly could give, though, or even you, Chris. I'm you're great. much smarter than me. <laughs> uh, well, Kelly, what's a, given that you helped get the, this whole ball rolling on the labeling AMPR and now are at the Good Food Institute, what, what's the Good Food Institute's position on, on the AMPR and, and some of the positions that they might have taken? Well, I would defer a little bit to, to my colleagues at GFI who work full-time on the regulatory side of things and were active in, in drafting GFI's response to the ANPR. But I think by and large, I, I can say that we were um, very, felt very positively when we read the ANPR. In particular, um, Dipti touched upon um, the elements of the ANPR that describe the pathway by which a company can seek pre-approval of its labels before the regulations are finalized. From our perspective, that's a really positive um, development on the regulatory side because it enables a pathway to market before these regulations are fully baked, so to speak. Um, and as we know from, from numerous past examples, uh, the regulatory process, particularly when it comes to food stuff, can take an exceptionally long time. So providing a, a pathway for these innovative products to, to reach market um, before those final regulations are published is, is a really positive development. Um, we're also encouraged to see indications around um, USDA's enforcement of the statutes under which it has um, jurisdiction for regulating these products, as well as its continued um, alignment at various points that Dipti touched on with, with FDA and recognizing that it will continue to um, develop jointly principles for labeling together with FDA. So that close coordination between the, the agencies, given that sort of divergent um, jurisdictional uh, separation of our food system, to see those two agencies collaborating closely on this um, is really encouraging. And, and it's another example of government working well. Uh, and if I may, point of personal privilege, you and I first met when you were just living in Cambridge and you came to see uh, one of our events, I think probably about six years ago, where Bruce Friedrich spoke um, when he was just starting the Good Food Institute. Um, and you expressed to him at the time that one day you hoped to work for GFI. Um, during that following year, you expressed interest to me about attending law school and end up coming to Harvard Law School and being a superstar. And now here you are full circle six years later working at GFI doing policy work. It really makes my heart proud to see. So can you talk a little bit about the related issues and work you're doing now at GFI? Sure. Thanks, Chris. And, and again, I, I'm so grateful for all of the support and opportunities that, that the clinic and the Animal Law and Policy Program and, and you have helped to create for students who are interested in, in this, this issue area and in policy um, as it relates to animals um, more broadly. Um, just some fantastic opportunities for hands-on experience that um, helped me develop the skills and experience that I needed to um, be successful in my current role. So as you mentioned in my bio early on, my current role involves advocating for alternative proteins in front of lawmakers on Capitol Hill and in front of federal executive branch agencies. Um, GFI's primary focus in that advocacy work right now is on securing additional um, public funding for alternative protein research and development. So I'm using the term alternative protein to describe a, an umbrella of sort of three interrelated terms, um, cultivated being one, which we've already heard um, Eric's excellent definition of, which is a fairly similar to the one that we, we use in our Hill meetings. Um, we also use the term alternative proteins to refer to plant-based proteins that mimic the same sensory characteristics and experiences as conventional animal proteins as well as fermented, which um, involves both whole biomass fermentation and precision fer fermentation, um, but with cultivated and plant-based proteins being the two, two bigger pillars of that, at least right now. Um, so we're recognizing that um, even though, as, as Eric touched upon, some of the ideas for, for these types of foods have been around for, um, for decades or for centuries, and, and certainly plant-based foods have been consumed in various forms for, for human history, um, the actual dedication of, of resources and time and talent to um, creating proteins that replicate the same experience, or in other words, taste the same or better, and ideally cost the same or less than animal um, conventional animal proteins, which is what GFI's whole mission is to, is to achieve, um, that that's new, that, that in, in the course of human history, that's really, really a nascent effort. I mean, a couple of decades at, at the most, really, um, in any substantive way. So there are a lot of foundational questions that 
that remain to be to be answered or that could be answered more quickly. We've seen tremendous um, growth of investment in this sector. Over the past decade, we've seen about $11 billion being invested in the alternative protein sector on the private side. About 5 billion of that was just in the past year alone. So really remarkable pace of growth of investment in this industry, but that's, that's on the private side. And we recognize that there's a role for government to play in accelerating um, the pace of development of these products. I mean, I, I touched upon the, the need for producing more with less in the face of some pretty significant global challenges. And so we believe that al although companies um, like Eric's and, and many others are doing some incredibly exciting work, there's room for more and there's room for things to happen even faster. And we've seen some really powerful examples of where government funding can help catalyze that development with, with some really impactful case studies like the or origination story of Beyond Meat, for example. So that's our primary thing that we're advocating on in front of uh, congressional offices and agencies um, with the belief that this will help um, expedite the development of the sector. Wonderful. And Dipti, as, as was described a little bit earlier, uh, and, and, and Kelly just talked about how there's such great uh, collaboration between the two agencies. We've also heard that there will be increased transparency from the agencies regarding regulatory decisions for cultivated meat and poultry products. Can you share your thoughts on developments within this space and the potential implications for that? Sure. Um, and you're absolutely right. There has been a heightened level of transparency for cultivated products, beginning with the development of the framework for oversight um, and now moving to individual product decisions. With respect to oversight, you know, it's it's been a a busy three years. Um, both agencies have had public meetings. FDA convened a, a public advisory committee meeting, and then both FDA and FSIS have opened multiple public comment processes have, and have indicated that they intend to engage in further processes. One of those that is of, of significant interest is the individual product determinations and what will be the corresponding documents that the agencies um, issue uh, after that. Um, on the FDA side, the agency has indicated that it'll make uh, data and information supporting safety considered as part of um, its pre-market consultations public on its website. Um, this is still a work in progress. Uh, the agency has indicated that it intends to issue new guidance about what goes into a pre-market submission and presumably what will be posted on, on its website. Um, but until then, I think uh, we can expect for FDA to provide, um, provide much of this information, um, bearing in mind confidentiality considerations under, under the disclosure statutes. So this, this approach will, will likely provide for a good deal of transparency um, and, and, and but, but bearing in mind the substantial proprietary information that the agency has to consider. On the labeling side, um, uh, in addition to the public comment processes that we've all talked about that, that provide additional transparency regarding the agency's um, rules that they're going to establish, um, uh, we can expect FSIS to make case-by-case -case determinations on labeling public. They haven't said specifically how they intend to do this, um, but they've signaled that they intend um, for, for determinations to be, to be made public in some way. And so moving to the implications of all of this, you know, there's a real balancing act at play here. On the one hand, um, public processes provide for increased stakeholder uh, and consumer understanding and awareness. Um, which conventional wisdom says is good. Um, on the other hand, they take time to complete. Rulemaking takes time um, and can cause uh, much longer regulatory timelines, um, particularly for individual companies, um, many of whom, as Kelly briefly touched on, are, are startups and are eager to move to commercialization to fund R&D and launch efforts and, and you know, quite frankly, to keep the lights on. Um, so in addition with increased public discourse, you're also going to have disclosure of company information, um, particularly when you're dealing with a new technology, there's risk that proprietary and other highly valuable information will be disclosed. Um, and that can put first movers 
at a potential disadvantage. Um, so this will be an interesting area to watch. Um, and it, it certainly is one that is balancing the interest of transparency and disclosure against the interests of um, the time it takes to achieve that level of, of disclosure and the proprietary interests that may be divulged as a result of this, that disclosure. Great. And Eric, what do you see as the other main federal regulatory issues that are looming uh, for your company apart from labeling? Yeah, they're, they're the same that would be for, in reality, any other food producer, especially if you're making meat or poultry uh, and catfish, of course, uh, the one outlier for some reason uh, that we always have to mention, um, is, is that once you have a safety steps for any food ingredient that you may be putting or food product that, that would then be passed along to, to USDA, then you have to obtain a grant of inspection for that particular product or process. And then in the case of USDA regulated products, having pre-approval on some label of that product as well. So there's sort of this tripartite approach that's really important to sort of get through each step. Um, and again, you would do this if you were producing a hot dog, uh, it, it, you know, from a conventional conventional meat sources, as well as whether it's from, from cultivated or not. So for us, we're facing the same issues um, as well. And, and so again, from the standpoint that, that we've said from the get-go of having a level playing field um, with, with other conventional uh, industries, and they themselves have asked for a level playing field. You know, in, these, in this case, it's, it is a level, level playing field and that we're going through the same gates and steps that any other food product would have to go through. Again, an appropriate regulatory burden. Um, and so for us, that's, that's largely what we're, we're facing at this point. Great. So up till now, we've been talking about uh, the regulation at the federal level. Um, but in the past couple of years, we've seen a proliferation of legislation at the state level, attempting to restrict the labeling of cultivated products and plant-based ones as well. Uh, for example, under current Georgia law, it's unlawful to label any cultivated meat product as, quote, meat or any meat product from an animal, unquote, without identification as, quote, lab-grown, lab-created, or grown in a lab. Um, interestingly, it, to me, it's interesting that up till now, many of those, the challenges to those laws have been instigated by nonprofit organizations, such as the Good Food Institute and the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and they've sort of been fighting those battles on behalf of industry. So Kelly, I know that uh, it's not your particular area that you work on at GFI, but can you talk a little bit about GFI's work uh, that you've been doing just to sort of keep track of what's happening at the state level and involvement in some of the litigation? Sure. Thanks, Chris. And, and as you know, this is not my, my primary area, but hopefully I can give a bit of an overview. GFI has been active in um, trying to advocate against the enactment of uh, state label censorship bills, essentially since, since its founding in 2016. Um, that involvement has you know, evolved over time um, as the needs have changed. Uh, we, we continue to be active in, in tracking and monitoring where these bills are introduced. Um, we often provide staff to, to testify, um, and we also leverage contract lobbyists um, who are specialized um, in the local context there um, to challenge these bills, which we view as um, essentially unfair uh, regulatory barriers for, um, for these companies that, that um, are, are being imposed in ways that they wouldn't be on their, on their counterparts. Um, and we've heard some of the the legislators go on the record about being very explicit about their intention to, to um, be protectionist of the incumbent um, industry. And um, GFI, in addition to, to tracking these legislative efforts as they're introduced, um, has also been active in, in, in being involved in litigation efforts or being co-counsel to litigation efforts. Um, we've done those in partnership with other organizations, other nonprofits, like you mentioned, um, Animal Legal Defense Fund is one um, that we've worked um, in Louisiana supporting actually a company in this space, Turtle Island Foods, um, which is also known as Tofurky. Um, and uh, those, those organizations have also been active in other states. Um, Plant-Based Foods Association is another organization. They're a trade association that has been active in this space. And so as, as time goes on, who is, who is active in this space and in what capacity may change? Um, given how nascent this all is, um, but we were encouraged to see that the pace of the introduction of these bills did slow in 2021, and that's a, that's a positive signal um, from, from our perspective, but we'll continue to monitor um, 
these bills as they come up, um, but we're also seeing some positive signals of bills, um, for example, a bill in Minnesota that would actually be supporting alternative protein research. Um, it hasn't been enacted, but it's been introduced and has received a hearing that, that one, of, one of my colleagues testified at. So it's not just you know, bad news at the state level. There's actually a lot of opportunity there for um, some positive support for the growth of the sector and for answering some of these research questions uh, more broadly. Great. It does seem like the the genesis and the the pace of them mirrored the the ag ag legislation of uh, you know five or six years ago, where there was this quick burst and then people really kind of rethought it and didn't seem like that good of an idea. And they've they've certainly waned since then. Uh, turning internationally, Eat Just Good Meat Company already is selling cultivated chicken nuggets in Singapore, and also recently received government approval to increase production there. Uh, there also are companies moving forward in Israel and, and other countries as well. Can any of you speak to what the regulatory terrain is like in other territories around the world and if they might clear a regulatory path sooner than the United States? I mean, I can, I can kick it off again uh, from my, from my lawyerly, non-lawyerly perspective, but the, the well, first off, the, the approval in Singapore is, a, is a, definitely a rising tide benefits all ships sort of scenario. Uh, having, and it, I think it signals an incredibly important moment that that again, um, cultivated meat is is going to become on market. It is no longer science fiction. It is science, and it is an inevitability. It is food, and, and it is a, another way to bring like a well loved human tradition to the plates of millions and hopefully billions of people over the next decades. Um, from a from a standpoint of international regulation, again, it is. I think it's on the minds of many many different governments. And they are, are both simultaneously looking to others like Singapore and the US and also developing their own frameworks. And I can tell, again, given the nature of how many companies exist now, and it's probably on the order of closer to 100 cultivated meat companies, on, on, and the fact that they're distributed all over the globe indicates that, that most countries are going to have to contend with some framework that they either develop or adopt or adapt um, or some form of reciprocity with an existing government, especially if things are going to be exported from say the United States to, to their country. Um, some may choose to just see it as meat uh, and, and with no special disclaimer, and they may just accept it as such, um, which again, will open up another I said, set of interesting questions, I'm sure legally. Um, but um, for us, I think it's still very early, um, but I don't know, again, maybe Dipti or Kelly have a, have something to add or a different perspective. I think you summarized that really nicely. And, you know, it's not a zero sum game here um, to, to have a um, jurisdiction like Singapore um, uh, dedicate the time and resources that it has to this and other alternative protein technologies is incredibly encouraging. It's part of their 30 for 30 goal. They've been really, um, They've been working closely with industry on this, um, and and you know and 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 they they as part of a, a regulatory roundtable they held a couple of years ago. Um, they had um, regulators from the U.S., the EU, China, Japan, um, FSANS uh, come and explain their paradigms, and then they they modeled their their paradigm based upon what they heard. And so there are a lot of similarities if you look at their mo most recent guideline between um, the Singapore uh, framework and, and what um, FDA and USDA are sort of moving towards without the bifurcation, without the centuries long history of food law. Um, and so we are seeing um, regulatory agencies adapt and, and learn from one another. So incredibly encouraging for the industry. And I would just note very, very briefly in addition to those, those very well said comments um, that we're, we're really excited to see the growth of the industry as, as Eric mentioned, over a hundred companies now that are specifically focused on cultivated meat and around 60 other companies that are focused on, um, you know, maybe life, life sciences companies that are producing or saying they're, they're intending to produce cultivated products as part of a broader product line, that that increased uh, company interest in this space and investment in this space is now encouraging regulators in some jurisdictions to move faster. And then as regulators move faster, that may also further encourage the growth of companies. So it's really a, a positive feedback loop from our perspective. 
And yeah, the New York Times just reporting last week about the investment going into this space, including major ag companies such as Archer Daniel Midland and the Brazilian meat giant JBS. Um, and it's not just private investment. Uh, even the USDA recently allocated $10 million to establish a cellular agricultural research center just down the road here at Tufts University. So it's, it's, it's just pretty amazing how fast this is happening. So we're just about at our time. So I will go to our final question here for each of you. Um, I know you all likely will hate this question, but given the title of the panel, I, I have to ask, when do you estimate that the first cultivated meat product will be available in stores to US consumers? Don't all rush to answer. <laughs> well, I'm going to note that again, I said at the, at the beginning, I'm a former federal regulator, not a current. And therefore, I think that puts me at a huge disadvantage to answer this question. So I'll say from the perspective, again, the people that know the answer to that question with some degree of certainty uh, are, are not on this panel. Um, and, and to save everyone a little bit of a little bit of um, of worry in their answer. I think that again, it is a, it's going to be a dance between the companies that produce these products and the regulators also working efficiently together. Um, again, as I said, and, and Uma, our founder has said many times, this is not science fiction, it is, it is a reality. And so at this point, it really comes down to how effectively do the companies that are producing uh, interface with the US government to ensure that these products are safe and truth, truthfully labeled and that consumers will know what they're purchasing when they do. When those steps that I mentioned earlier are in place, you can likely expect an, an ability to be able to see these products on market in the United States. And I think that's a lot sooner than people realize. I'd be remiss to give you an actual number because like Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the moment I put a stake in the ground, it will immediately shift as is expected. So I'm hoping by being somewhat nebulous that an approval will be much more likely uh, uh, that you will see in the future for all of us. But I don't know, maybe Dipti, if you, or Kelly, if you have anything to add. And I think our listeners are more interested in stakes on plates than stakes in the ground, but yeah, we'll see what Dipti has to say. Pun very much appreciated. <laughs> no, I, I think Eric uh, hit the nail on the head. There's, there's some steps that have to happen here. Um, from a distance, it can seem like this is quite far away, but um, from, from what I've seen, people are progressing. Um, and I mean, remember, we're talking about a new, new technology that we want consumers to understand and ultimately love. Um, and so getting to the place where um, you, you, you have an administrative record uh, that supports those um, regulatory determinations is really important. And I imagine both FSIS and FDA are thinking about just that. So I, I, I like the way that Eric described it sooner than, than it may seem. I, um, I too am not going to put any, any uh, metaphoric stakes um, in the ground, though I will be looking forward to putting a cultivated stake on my plate. <laughs> And, and I will I will also say on behalf of head of product design at Upside Foods, we look forward to putting steaks on people's plates as well uh, from the cultivated variety. I, I will add to Dipti's very good point, and I want to add to this notion. Part of this is also we as a, at Upside want to get this right. We know that we have to earn consumer trust, and that means not just bull rushing to market with the product that we think is safe. We have to demonstrate this. We have to bring stakeholders along. We have to build our big tent. And we have done that from moment one, and we've been deliberate and thoughtful at every step. I do believe it is inevitable. Um, I can tell you that we are we are marching towards market. Um, so, we, but I want to also say that we put safety first, and also so we're going to get this right. And when you come to market, you will know an upside cultivated chicken product is going to be safe and delicious. And, you know, that's exactly one of the motivations we had in putting together the roundtable in 2018, which I kept calling the, the Leroy Jenkins effect, that, you know, we were worried that someone's going to go sprinting through that door unprepared and might mess it up for get everyone behind them killed. So we really thought it'd be good to bring everyone together and kind of think this through collectively because everyone is in it uh, in a collective sense. And it's, it's really great to hear that that's exactly what's happening, that people are being very deliberate and thinking this through, not in a race to just rush to market uh, to be first, but they're really making sure it's, it's being done right. Kelly, do you have anything to add? Well, this is a high stakes question, Chris. But I see that we're at time, so I will just keep it brief and say hopefully soon. 
Great. It's a village, y'all. We, we, we wouldn't be here without Harvard Law. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing this without the legal system and the talented scientists and, and everyone and the, the wider stakeholder group as well. So it's, it's, we're getting there quickly because all of us are working together. I hope that continues. And, and none of us would be here talking about this if it wasn't for Uma and people like you devoting your lives to furthering and developing and innovating this technology. And it's just really exciting. And uh, I can't thank you all enough. So th thanks everyone for listening and, and my deep, deep gratitude to each of the panelists for taking the time to share your insightful expertise with us. And uh, fingers crossed, we're just really excited to see how this all develops. And uh, we may be tapping you again in the future to, to give us all an update. But uh, thank you all so much and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Take care. Bye-bye.